proliferation. The reason is, uh, first of all, this is the uh, <coughs> Internet Governance Forum. And uh, so the many of you who may be familiar with the Internet Governance may not be familiar with uh, <coughs> cyberspace governance. And uh, if you look into the Wikipedia, probably you cannot find anything. And uh, <coughs> so the cyberspace governance is still in the very early stage. And here we try to sort of uh, discuss what is, it, what is it, what's the uh, issue, and what's the relationship with the Internet governance. Those are the uh, things we want to discuss in this order. And uh, first of all, we try to show the video <coughs> from the University of Toronto. Uh, but uh, seems to be computer is having uh, some problems, so we may show later. It's a very nice video. And uh, <coughs> unfortunately, Ron uh, Debert, he's uh, attending another workshop over there, and uh, so that he cannot <coughs> join today. And uh, then uh, first I go through the uh, introduction of a cyberspace, not a cyberspace governance. Okay? Then... <coughs> Uh, from the MIT, Professor Nazri Chokri is going to uh, show the uh, <coughs> present on uh, who controls cyberspace. Then uh, uh, we'll have a <coughs> then we have a, from the University of Mexico, Alejandro Pisanti is trying to join remotely, <coughs> but yesterday it was not too successful. I'm I'm not too sure if he can join successfully. Otherwise, we sh will show the, his uh, presentation material, one page. Then uh, we go through the uh, uh, Amelia. Would you like to stand up now? Uh, she's the um, <coughs> youngest uh, parliament member of the European Parliament. Uh, <coughs> then uh, uh, Adil Akprojan, would you like to stand up? He, he's the uh, Africa, uh, Afrinic CEO. <coughs> Then uh, Johan uh, Hallenborg, uh, he's from the uh, Swedish uh, uh, Foreign Ministry. Then uh, uh, we'll have an open discussion. Can you show the, uh, my presentation material of uh, full control cyberspace? Oh. Uh, yeah, cyberspace. Uh, yeah, that one, that one. Yes, please. Can you go to the uh, uh, full size? I try to show basically uh, two page. And uh, can you go next? Okay. Uh, this is a sort of order presentation material, but I try to explain. Some within five to ten minutes using a two presentation material. <coughs> okay. Next one, please. Okay. First of all, cyberspace. Uh, let me try to elaborate. What's the cyberspace? Sort of compared to the the real space. Then the second, uh, uh, since it's an internet governance forum, what's the relationship between a cyberspace and the internet? And uh, at least uh, for today's discussion, we should have uh, some <coughs> uh, agreed uh, concept. Okay, can you show next? Okay, here is the uh, cyberspace and the uh, real space. You can see the, uh, <coughs> uh, the real space here. Then uh, uh, we discuss on the real uh, cyberspace. And to make it more complicated, we have a mixed space. And actually, many of the cases, when we say cyberspace, is a mixed space rather than a pure uh, uh, cyberspace. Okay, do you know what is the uh, mixed space? Okay, the best, best example <coughs> is a Google Glass. You, you have a Google Glass, and you can see the real space with your eye, and also you see the, those... Uh, a cyberspace, and uh, it's, they overlap. That's the beautiful uh, uh, example. And uh, we have uh, many more uh, case, and uh, which probably you may you may raise the issue. <coughs> so the today's discussion, 
We talk both cyberspace and the mixed space. And it tend to be more of a, a mixed space. For example, <coughs> uh, we have a guest from uh, Korea uh, who is the uh, Human Rights Commission. Okay, human right or privacy. Yes, we have uh, the real space, the human right issue. And also in uh, cyberspace. So let's say uh, cyber human space, uh, human rights. Or cyber privacy. Okay, then uh, in the reality, uh, we tend to discuss more on, uh, in the mixed space, combining uh, the real space human rights and the uh, uh, cyberspace uh, uh, human rights. And uh, beyond, still kind of very exploratory. Oh, next one, please. Okay, next one is the uh, cyberspace. <coughs> what is it compared to the Internet? Uh, you can see Internet here, IP-based IP infrastructure. Then we have other infrastructure. Uh, for example, uh, smartphone. Smartphone without the IP application. For example, smartphone addiction is not a, a, a really an internet infrastructure. Something, something beyond. Okay, so the, we have a two. Uh, <coughs> Infrastructure, and uh, uh, then on top, we have uh, many of those uh, applications. David Clark from MIT uh, stated in his paper, uh, uh, this is an uh, aspect. Uh, aspect means it's, they are not really mutually exclusive. You thought of a, a cyberspace from many uh, aspects, from many views. Okay, and uh, the one most popular one, or popular, I shouldn't say popular, the one we discuss most often these days is uh, cybersecurity. For example, you had a cyber, cyberspace conference in Seoul last week, and uh, most of the discussion is in the cybersecurity. Then uh, uh, the big one is the cyber economy. And uh, like, for example, here we don't really discuss on the cyber economy. Then, uh, uh, then cyber uh, society, including uh, human rights, uh, privacy, abuse, many, many things related to the uh, society itself. Okay, so the cyber, when we say cyberspace, seems to be including this whole thing. So the, you may consider cyberspace is a superset of inter, uh, internet. So the naturally cyberspace governance would be the superset of uh, uh, superset of inter internet uh, <coughs> governance, but we'll see how does, how does any, anything particularly different from internet governance or well, it's pretty much mostly say, uh, similar or same. With that, uh, can we go through the, uh, oh, okay, I'll show you a couple more. Can we go next one? Okay, aspect. <laughs> uh, David Clark uh, said that uh, society, security, economy are the three major aspects. Then, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, we have a couple more, like a nation state, cyber nation state, and uh, including uh, those uh, international relations, uh, which uh, uh, MIT professor Nazli Chokri is going to explain. Then uh, uh, cyber environment, and uh, many more. Okay, with that, let me start from the uh, stop here, and uh, let's go to the uh, uh, Professor Nazli Chokri. Can you make us ready? Either WebEx, she tried to join with WebEX. If it doesn't work, I don't know, we show the uh, video. Can you show the, her uh, presentation material? We have a presentation material. Oh, the one, whatever, MIT or something. No, no. Can you go back? Oh, no, no. Oh. No, no, no. no. Oh, that, that, the first one. Yeah. Yeah. Is 
she is here. Yeah, Nazri is coming. Nazri, would you like to make a presentation? Hello? Can you hear me? Oh? I have talked to over there. It's nine o'clock over there <laughs> at night. Okay. While she tries to get in, uh, let me explain. We have uh, several research uh, centers, mostly in the northern uh, North America, including uh, this one by Harvard and MIT, uh, exploration in uh, cyber international relations. Then the uh, University of Toronto has the uh, Cyber Dialogue Conference, and the Georgetown University also has a, a similar one. Then uh, uh, Oxford University is doing something on, in this area. Those are the ones uh, we are aware of. Nazri, would you be ready? Yes, yes, I'm ready. Yes, please. Go ahead. So the question is, who controls cyberspace? And uh, I'd like to look at it from the point of view of the state, the state system. Remember, the state is a late cover uh, to cyberspace and to its management. The system was run, remains run by the private sector, and uh, the state has entered into this arena on the one hand with matters of control and on the other hand with issues of governance. Um, at the same time, we've seen major shifts in the global context. Uh, the shifts are really tremendous. Uh, next, please. The enormous expansion of uh, the state system in terms of the number of states. Uh, I hope you can see the slide there. Um, and an expansion in the number of, of non-states. Point being that there are many, many actors uh, that uh, interact over governance and over over the uh, internet. Please tell me if you can see the slide. Yes, we are seeing. Good. So uh, this raises the question. Next slide, please. Uh, who controls? Who can control? And who should control? And we ask: Are these matters of technology, of institutions, of network logic? of power, of politics, what, what is this about? Um, next, please. And if we have to remember the enormous shift in the international context and international relations. Uh, I won't read the slide, but compare the 20th century power politics on the left side of the screen with the 21st century complexity uh, of cyber politics, the non-state actors, and so forth. The important part of all this is at the bottom of that slide when we look at the multi-stakeholder pressure. Stakeholders from of various types are putting pressure and making themselves understood and demanding an influence in governance. This was not the case uh, in the 20th century and 20th century power politics or even cyber politics. Next, please. So where are we now? Uh, all the elements that are on this slide, you are all familiar with. Major asymmetries, uh, the dominance of the private sector operators. We think of operators as technicians, uh, but they're really very influential and very powerful. We also know that there's a leveling of the playing fields in, in, in uh, in the cyber domain, the internet and the entire cyber no domain, leveling in the sense that um, diversity is dominant and even the weaker actors are in influential. And most important of all, we have density of decision makers. Many, many, many different types of groups influence the decisions that are being made about the management of the system. Now, why is that? Because 
uh, we have gone through major changes in the demography and in the ecology of cyberspace. Now, you know that, uh, but we have to keep that in mind when we address the matters of control. Uh, next, please. I wanted to share this particular set of slides with you because of the proximity, the closeness of the trend uh, in Internet access and in mobile cellular subscription between developing countries and developed countries. Uh, we now have a, a world, these slides represent really this leveling phenomenon I was, I was talking about, which is new, which is a, a change in the cyber domain and in the, uh, our politics and in the traditional physical domain. But there are other changes as well that influence uh, the, the parameters of control. Next, please. This is what I think is the most important of all, and it, that is even an old, old reckoning record of the rate of change of languages that are used uh, in, the cyber, in the cyber domain. The rates of growth between 2000 and 2007, and this huge uh, outlier is Arabic. But all the other non-English languages are also growing, and grown, have grown, and are even growing more now at very high rates. This is part of the demography uh, and, and the leveling that, that we talked about. I mentioned. Let me move on to another aspect of the, 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 the uh, politics and the distribution of state influence in that domain. Next, please. I wanted to share this slide with you. It's about denial of service. It's been put together uh, by uh, a, a, a group at MIT and it's in the technology review, and it represents the diversity of motives for the denial of service. All states exercise a measure of control over the access and the, and, the, uh, and the services that are being provided. We take this for granted because, after all, this is what states do. They've always done it. Uh, but in this case, um, what's re very relevant is the diversity and the differences in, in um, the goals and, uh, and the motivations. And that's the reality that we live with when we talk about control or, or in some cases, uh, conflict over control. Next slide, please. What is also very new now is, uh, is uh, the density in the actors that are involved in decision making. I mentioned that earlier, uh, and, and here I would like to remind you of the difference between control, which is operational leverage, uh, and governance, which has to do more with rulemaking, principles, and the like. In both cases, in the control and in the governance domains, many, many, many different entities are at the table, so to speak, uh, but only the states are actual voters. Remember, the system as a whole is run so far by private entities. So we have something of, of, of a um, unprecedented set of, uh, I won't say tensions, but I would say uh, pressures for the renegotiation of, of control mechanism and, and governance. And I'd like to repeat one more time uh, the issue of uh, multiple and mobilized stakeholders, which is the last bullet on this, uh, on this chart. Uh, and that is not going to go away. The influence of stakeholders other than the state, but one of the most important stakeholders, of course, is the state. Next, please. So here's the complexity of control, the checklist of issues we are concerned about. Why control? What, why control? What is it that must be controlled? And the denial of service was simply an example. Um, how to control? Technical measures, regulatory methods, uh, coordinated measures. Once we get to formal accord, then we're in the governance domain. But as you well know, the instruments for control are, are uh, quite important. And then finally, when to control. All of these are up in the air, there's no consensus, and different states with different capabilities just use different leverages uh, in, this, uh, in the complexity uh, domain. Next, please. Uh, the the uh, chair, uh, Professor Chan, mentioned David Clark. Uh, here I'd like to uh, highlight 
the way we have approached the relationship, the connection between international relations, the world of power, of politics, of countries, of states, etc., and the Internet, the core of, of cyberspace. Um, and if you look closely at this matrix, um, you will see that on one axis we have uh, uh, the way we think about international relations, the individual, state, international system, global system, etc. And then if you look at the rows, it's uh, a representation of different rows of, uh, of the Internet itself. And what's in the cells of this matrix, if you look specifically at the state column, the column of the state, which is the third column from the, uh, from the left, it gives you a sense of the where the state has control, how it controls, uh, and uh, these are simply examples. And what we would get out of this is that many, many fingers, many, many influences are on the topography uh, of control from the international relations side trying to impact on the cyber domain and, uh, and vice versa. Now, where does this leave us? Uh, next slide, please, and I'm almost finished. It leaves us thinking about the contours of control or the parameters of control at this point in time. Uh, what is it that we're absolutely certain about? We're certain about the power of demographic diversity, uh, the tradition and the influence of the state system. The state system is not going to go away, but it's no longer the only dominant entity in the system. The salience of multi-stakeholders, uh, the power of the ISPs, uh, we have underestimated the power of the operational side in relation to the instruments that the state has to influence the operational side. Now, all of this has contributed contributing to the necessity of, of revisiting governance. But all of this, and this is my concluding sentence, all of this illustrates something of a stalemate uh, in the cyber domain with respect to control, who controls. Uh, and we are at a juncture where different entities control different uh, features and nobody dominates, and it actually is a stalemate. And what we must think about is what are the advantages for the global system and the cyber system at this point in time of being in a stalemate? And if you think about it, there could be some advantages. And with this, I would say, next slide, please. And thank you. And I am done. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Nazri, are you going to stay here uh, until the uh, end of this session? Yes. Okay. Then the next one, yeah, Amelia, would you like to make a comment? Uh, and we'll prepare for the uh, uh, Alejandro presentation from the Mexico, which may take some time. So you, why don't you go ahead? And I am here, Kellen. Oh, you're here? Okay, then I'll just give him time. But I will, I will, I will speak after oh, Amelia. Okay. Let, let her have the floor. Thank you. So, um, thank you, Kilam, and thank you for everyone who's here. My name is Amelia Andersdottir, and I'm a member of the European Parliament for the Pirate Party. Um, I thought that the topic of the session was uh, interesting, uh, since it touches on some of the dilemmas that I feel have been addressed more um, also in the context of, of Internet governance. And I see these discussions both here and um, at the Eurodig in, Eurodigs in Europe about uh, what do we do with this place, uh, that we've created and where all of us are and how do we govern the social in interactions that occur on the digital space, in the digital space, how do we get along? And this is not a very trivial issue. It's not just a question of choosing the right protocol for getting along. You can't only rely on HTTP to ensure that there's peace and prosperity in the world. It's also a question of um, how do we uh, resolve conflicts that can arise between different parties in an online space. How do we uh, define um, what a conflict is that is relevant to solve in an online space? And I think these are some of the big challenges that face us now and that have been accentuated by the um, discussions that arose this summer of um, uh, security agencies and militaries and how do we deal with 
uh, police authorities creating special rules for technological implementations and computer software and um, how do we get past the fact that it is looking as if state actors are increasingly the ones spreading dissent and conflict on the internet when we expect them to be the authorities in society that actually resolves them. And so I've been hoping to um, um, address the, uh, my, some of my thoughts around uh, the possibilities of changing these problems. And because I work in the European um, space, um, the European Union was set up in the 1950s at some point because in Europe for a very long time also we had problems with the uh, police authorities and militaries and other agencies of government creating social problems for, for people. So for about 2,000 years, in fact, Europe was a battleground between different nation states trying to um, uh, get various advantages across each other. And also my own country around the Baltic Sea was striving for dominance for a very long time. The European Union, in theory, was a way to set up a place of trade and uh, interaction uh, that was peaceful and that allowed for civilian development and peaceful development um, in a way that the governments would be disincentivized from um, uh, continuing their conflicts. And so being born in 1987, it's not always very easy for me to um, relate to the purposes of the European Union. Um, a lot of my uh, childhood and in fact all of my adulthood is spent in a time when um, the conflicts of uh, U uh, Europe past have been um, more or less uh, irrelevant. Um, so not until I've actually started thinking about the Internet as a place where we now have renewed conflicts have I seen that maybe the European Union idea wasn't so bad after all. There is clearly a strong potential for the European Union to uh, continue its important mission to help um, governments in Europe and uh, people in Europe or even globally uh, to have a peaceful development of the Internet, but it would require the European Union to make some very tough choices and show very strong leadership with respect to its member states and a leadership that the member states may not at present be entirely willing to accept. Um, and so with the European Union going into Parliament elections next year, we're also going to find a new commission that will guide the executive of the European Union um, I will personally follow that development very closely um, because I think it, it, it could be genuinely um, interesting. Um, it is very clear that uh, cyberspace governance faces some tough challenges right now. Uh, we've had them, of course, all the time. Uh, but in this particular time, I think globally we're looking for somebody who's able to say that um, um, the Internet is a platform, uh, not for combat, not for war and, and not for uh, uh, distrust, but actually a place where we can get along with each other. And so the question is, which policy agent has the capacity to, to advance that point of view? It's very clear from the discussions here also that a lot of the issues that we want to see solved on the Internet, they're not, they're not in the technical layer. We have a lot of um, social problems now, and they will have to be addressed also. But I wanted to throw that into the room and see if there's anyone else who's maybe sympathetic to this idea. Thank you. Uh, next one is the Alejandro. Are you ready? Yes, sir. I'm yeah, uh, we are projecting the, uh, your uh, memo so that you can, you can start now. Uh, he's from the, uh, uh, presenting from the Mexico. Please go ahead. Alejandro, so on. Yes, please go ahead. Can you hear me well? Not too well. Can we have a video and stay only in voice? Can you hear me? Oh, yes, we, yes, we can. But okay. not too good. I am not going to, to use the video channel in order to make the voice channel cleaner. Okay. Um, I will make a small preface to that statement. Uh, thank you for projecting it. Uh, apologies for um, If I knew you were going to project it, I would have done a nice PowerPoint. Uh, I'm very honored also to speak about, uh, after uh, Amelia, whom I respect and, uh, and, and uh, like very much for her participation. And after Professor Nasli Chukri, who has given us a masterful uh, 
uh, overview of issues. My comment goes precisely along some of the lines of their issues and the ones by Amelia. Um, cyberspace, as uh, Professor Tukri has mentioned, and as Kilnan has convinced us, is much, much larger than the Internet. And uh, there are a lot of uh, sources of power and fossils for power in cyberspace. Uh, some uh, consideration has to be made to the infrastructure, the, to, the, to the physical equipment of computers and telephones, what we call ICTs in general, information and communication technologies, and the control and regulation of standards over markets, over ways to use them, what is legal, what is ethical, is uh, very large. And uh, Internet governance, uh, in particular, is a more narrow, uh, more, a slightly better defined subject, which uh, has provided some experiences that we also have now reflected on the cyberspace governance. In particular, what has been very useful in Internet governance and the historical evolution of Internet governance is that it has been progressing by identifying problems and then looking for solutions to each of these problems, bringing together the right mix of what we now call stakeholders. Uh, the first act, let's say, of Internet governance was establishing standards so that people could interoperate or intercommunicate. And the IEPF uh, was created for that, and then the process of requests for comments or RFCs was created for that. Later, uh, things needed, the IETF needed meetings and uh, some interface with the outside and they created the Internet Society. Um, they also, the IETF also created uh, IANA to as a solution to a very big problem, which was there are a few unique identifiers which you need to have unique mathematical value and you had a database there which is central, so you created IANA. When IANA began to get into conflicts, when domain names began to have monetary value and litigation was moving, uh, the decision was made to create ICANN. And what ICANN does is make IANA decisions non-arbitrary because there's a policy development process there, and therefore it shields IANA from litigation. So, of course, you have a lot of litigation now against on the ground ICANN. And so forth, you have the anti-phishing working group, you have the messaging and the abuse working group, and many other things that come up in order to solve specific problems. Uh, suddenly, while this is evolving and we know of the contention for the state uh, in general, a particular country is trying to play power games or to really assert more power or serve their citizens better, depends on how optimistic you are about each state. Uh, we get the news this year uh, from the Snowden and espionage relations, uh, which have continued because we see now that more and more countries are actually going beyond the law in uh, surveying and spying the communications of citizens of their own country, of people outside the country, of commercial secrets. Uh, this list will be endless. The, the only guarantee we have is, the only knowledge we have about it is that it will never end. And given that, uh, uh, this uh, has now permeated the whole internet governance uh, debate, and it will go into Like, for example, what guarantees you can have that in computer you buy or the software you buy do not have uh, backdoors accessible to the state. And further, it is not only the state that is big brother, we have lots of little brothers spying on people, and we have criminals uh, spying on people uh, to do things like kidnapping uh, and so forth. So now I think that we have a big mess, uh, a big confusing mess in the discussion about Internet governance. Uh, because we actually do not have any espionage governments. There are very broad general agreements uh, about espionage, and most countries just go and break them as soon as they can, by on their own citizens, as I already said, or on other countries. Uh, we need to come back to the Internet governance debate and to the cyberspace governance debate more generally, uh, with a view that surveillance, privacy, uh, the intimacy of life and the privacy and secret of all, all confidentiality of communications are under threat. And each organization, each mechanism of Internet governance uh, is undertaking a review. Uh, the most effective review, uh, I think, that we are already seeing is the Internet Engineering Task Force, or IETF, which has now created a group and several activities in other uh, existing groups to review 
uh, privacy, snooping, surveillance, confidentiality, protection, implications of the Internet protocols. I think that we will have to do what we have always done successfully, which is identify what are the technical problems, solve them by layers, bring the right stakeholders, and look at upper layer mechanisms, what we call colloquially layer eight mechanisms, uh, to see what governments can agree inside the country and among themselves while helping the citizen, the law-abiding citizen of the people who are creative and who, are, who have great initiatives, as well as the people who are independent uh, inside oppressive countries, to be able to communicate again. But we, we will always have now this alteration of the landscape by uh, surveillance. And I will finish by saying that we should not say allow this alteration uh, of, uh, of the landscape to lead to something which is much worse, uh, which is confusion, because in this confusion, people are trying to compete with each other to see how they can, uh, how they can, uh, sorry, how they can uh, uh, take places uh, from each other uh, without exactly solving that problem. We, we are seeing in some countries what we can call wag the dot operations, which means basically that the country may be hiding its own operations of espionage against the citizens, uh, surveillance of communications, lack of privacy laws, etc., by complaining loudly about what is happening outside the country, and also using these very strong assertions to try to insert the state in ways that are not necessarily the natural, the, 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 the productive, the useful way to bring the state into a better position which is accepted by all stakeholders in internet governance. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Alejandro. <coughs> Next one is the uh, uh, AFRINIC uh, CEO, Adil. Would you like to make a comment? About five minutes. Okay, yeah, maybe less. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Kilnam. When I was... Uh, <coughs> Uh, first invite to talk about cyberspace governance. My first reaction was, well, cyberspace governance, that is internet governance. Why, why do we have to um, talk about a different term for, um, for uh, governance of anything related to the internet? But by looking at this closely, I think there is, a, there is something to explore here um, about not just the use of the IP or the Internet protocol <coughs> itself for communicating, for um, um, doing business, but uh, beyond that, uh, what, what would be the other usage of ICT uh, without IP, <coughs> but with the same purpose of advancing economy, advancing social environment, um, will that have any linkage, direct linkage, with the use of the IP protocol and the internet governance as we are talking, you know, all this week? Uh, what is the evolution of all this, this space, you know, um, the, 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 the use of the internet and uh, digital um, um, uh, equipment and device is becoming more and more pervasive in our environment. It, 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 it's spreading all, all around. And nothing tells us that it will be always using IP to interconnect, to exchange information or, 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 or other things. Bluetooth, we can use other, 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 other things. And there are communication, there are exchange of data, there are access of information. So, <clears throat> How do we, can we explore, um, uh, or which framework do we have to explore that overall digitalization of our, of our world um, is, is, is something that, that was, uh, was appealing to me. And um, I think I like, I like very much the, the first uh, presentation um, uh, with the slide that, that, that clearly show, um, especially the actors, the, 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 the the variety of actors that are involved in different aspects of what we know today as internet governance, but in other, uh, uh, um, other aspects of this cyberspace um, uh, as well. And sometimes the interest and the goal and the objective are sometimes conflicting in the way that uh, each of those actors um, uh, want or see things from different perspectives. And I also think that there is, uh, there is some uh, important exercise that we 
can and should try to do is to, and I think Alessandro also touched upon that very uh, briefly, it's about <coughs> the utilization or the usage that is made of the technology and the technology itself. Uh, <coughs> what is the demarcation between the, the, between the two? Uh, is the governance of the, um, 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 the technology that make the Internet work or the cyberspace work it, it, itself derive to uh, the usage of the technology, the, the utilization of the, tech, the technology uh, in both economic environment, social um, environment. Uh, is, there, is there a link? Can we, can we, can we see any, any um, uh, common uh, ground there? How can we define that? Um, uh, who, should, who should do that? The, those are questions <coughs> that I'm trying to put, put out because this is, this is a workshop and I will expect us to exchange on, on some of those things. Uh, what I do believe um, uh, fundamentally uh, coming from a developing country <coughs> is that uh, the internet that we uh, have used and we have known uh, in the 90s is not the internet that we have today. Um, he, at that time, it was very easy, very, very easy to solve many problems. I remember um, I have an engineering background. When you are deploying your infrastructure and you have a, a DNS issue or you have <coughs> even a spam issue, you can quickly find out where, what is that mail server that is not well configured and, 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 and it's relaying uh, uh, unauthorized mail very, very quickly and talking directly to the, to the, to the sysadmin of that infrastructure and get that fixed. Uh, it was easy because it was a, a small group of people who generally know um, each other, meet at ITF meeting every time, so they can uh, social engineer. Now thing has moved Tremendously. Um, uh, the, the, the interests are not always, I must say, uh, just to keep the Internet running. There is a dollar sign uh, very heavily uh, apparent at, at different level of, of, of this, which uh, makes that social engineering part getting a little bit to the, to the, to the edge of, of this, this environment. So it, we, we definitely have to take into consideration that, that, that widening scope of the Internet, the diversity that, that, that is, is brought into it, um, because, you know, there are, there are many, 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 many more countries and communities which are joining the, the Internet, which are using the Internet, which are finding the Internet as a critical tool for their day-to-day -day life. How do we integrate that in the overall in the overall, uh, overall picture, uh, how, how, how government play their role, um, how civil society actively play their role of balancing uh, all, all, all this in, in, in the environment. And I think it is, it is a very interesting notion, the cyberspace governance, but it needs to be very well elaborated to make it clear and, 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 and try to frame more, more specifically uh, its it, 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 it scope. Um, I, will, I will end by saying that uh, uh, the cyber security aspect could be seen as the most preeminent aspect of this uh, uh, issue about, about cyber, cyber, um, cyber space governance. Uh, <coughs> and uh, recent events have not uh, 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 allowed us to uh, maybe more put an emphasis on that. And I believe it is, it is very important to, for us to, to be able to look at uh, what we can do uh, to make sure that we have some uh, uh, common agreement on the road sign. I think uh, uh, that, is, that is very important. Every, every, uh, uh, everyone contributes to build global infrastructure, but the road sign should be something that allows <coughs> us to have a safety while using uh, those, um, 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 uh, I would say, inf infrastructure. And it is very important for us to, to look into that and deepen this notion of cyber governance if we can and demarcate it very clearly from Internet governance. Thank you. Thank you. Next one. <coughs> Johan, would you like to make a, a comment? Sure. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. My name is Johan. 
Um, I work at the Foreign Ministry in, in Sweden, in Stockholm, uh, at the International Law and Human Rights Department, mainly working with issues on freedom of expression um, and um, our work on human rights enjoyment also on, on the Internet. So thanks very much for inviting me. Um, I'd like to start by um, um, just saying that, that uh, Professor John's um, introduction here was, was very interesting, I think, uh, seeing different parts of, of the cyber, cyber arena, society, economy, and security. And um, be it as it may, uh, our take on this is that it's important to see this as, as one area and not try to um, divide um, the area into several different ones. And of course, coming from a human rights background, it's important for us to, to start by acknowledging that we have human rights in uh, the real space and they also apply in the cyber space. So that was my first, uh, first um, uh, comment. I think uh, Professor Nasli described the situation very well in her, in her presentation. Uh, this is also our uh, take on the current situation when it comes to a, a, a broader cyberspace governance, governance uh, picture uh, extending beyond the internet governance. What we see is that states are increasingly trying to assert control. And um, her presentation clearly um, um, explained the background uh, from where we're coming and unfortunately where we're going. Um, our take on this is that the success of the internet and the success of communications and ICTs, uh, it has to do with uh, the very little involvement by governments. It has to do with the fact that it, it did uh, develop without too much of government regulation. And so this is, this is what we think should be the, um, uh, the, continuing, uh, the continuing fundamental uh, starting point. It's important, just as Amelia said, to see cyberspace as basically an arena where we are able to, to uh, be together in a peaceful manner. And this is definitely uh, the aim of what we are trying to work for and work uh, to, to strive to achieve. Uh, and not an arena where conflicts are created and remain unresolved. In the work that I'm involved in, uh, we tend to work pretty much with traditional conflict resolutions, uh, states talking to each other, um, for example, in the United Nations environment. And what we see in, in those, in those uh, forums is that uh, there tends to be a division between security on one hand and then uh, the more, more softer issues such as human rights on, on the other. Um, but it's important to see that there are things happening um, Sweden was one of the promoters of, a, of the first resolution ever in the UN on human rights on the Internet. Last year, the Human Rights Council adopted a resolution on the enjoyment of human rights online. And it was adopted, finally, by, by consensus. So we have, uh, we, have a fundamental, uh, we have a fundamental text in the UN system which affirms that human rights are applicable online as well as offline. In another part of the UN system, we see the work of the, working, uh, of the group of governmental experts, uh, which are dealing, it's 15 countries, 15 government uh, experts, who work together to find some common ground on how they believe international law should apply in cyberspace, not just on the Internet, but in the broader ICT environment. And in that group, they reached a consensus this year that international law, existing international law, actually is applicable in the cyber environment as well. And this is actually the first time that such an agreement has been uh, reached. Although it, there is no normative instrument yet from, from that work, it's still a quite important conclusion because that's the first time that has been, that has been um, uh, said. So there are several different ways of, of trying to collaborate and find 
peaceful solution in how we socialize on, in the cyberspace broader than just the Internet. Our take on this has also resulted in a process we call the Stockholm Internet Forum. Uh, we, um, together with CEDA and our .se, uh, we have initiated a, a process where we discuss these issues in a comprehensive manner. And we think the added value here is that we, we reach out also to the low- and middle-income countries of the world. We provide a platform where development in, in a global context is discussed. So it's an annual, uh, it's an annual um, meeting place, and it's an annual conference um, where uh, a lot of discussions are going on, on a, from a comprehensive way. How can we utilize and work together and, and make cyberspace something that we can use to improve development? Not just in a peaceful manner, but also for economic growth and well-being. So we will continue to work on, on these and many other issues and trying to, to promote a, a peaceful and prosperous cyberspace. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all panelists, would you like to come over here? Uh, we'll have an open, open uh, discussion. Would you like to show the video now? Okay. On behalf, in place of uh, uh, <coughs> the Ron Devers from the University of Toronto, uh, we'll show the video, five minutes. And uh, are you? Oh, that's right. <laughs> so watch the video. That that will be better. Huh? Yeah. It won't be displayed. Yeah. No. It's, they will show the yeah video now. watershed moment for cyberspace. If you fast forward like 50 years down the road, future historians will look back and go, you know, there was that time in the 1990s and 2000s when the citizens of the Earth built this open distributed network and everyone could communicate with each other freely, and then it all shut down through censorship, surveillance, and weaponization. Yeah. 
regimes are trying to do, which is to disempower people and to not allow them to have control over their own lives and the tools of the man. We have to defend freedom of expression. Freedom of expression goes hand in hand with privacy. And I believe the freedom of internet is the biggest contribution to peace in the world. I work with a group of people in Morocco who were targeted by a software called Da Vinci. The number of these, what I call, digital arms or heavily intrusive systems have a label made in Europe or made in the United States. The digital arms trade is big business, and that means it won't stop. What used to be our global commons of information has become ground zero for intelligence agencies and military organizations around the world. If one side says, I'm building a national internet from which I can attack people, the rest of the world doesn't really have a choice. We are going to have to fight this out on a national basis. National security is important, but it's problematic when governments re-engineer a resource that the whole world uses for communication and for organization. I think you're all running out of time because the next really unpleasant event will cause people like me to pay a great deal more attention to the issue of cyber controls and no one will like the results. I think the future of cyberspace is not going to be determined by those of us living in Toronto or New York or even Silicon Valley, but by the next billion digital natives coming online from the global south. If we care about keeping cyberspace open and secure, we have to engage in a global dialogue. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi, so would you like to come over here? Uh, we'll have an open discussion. Yeah, anybody can make a comment? Yes, please. Stand up. Uh, thank you, Pindawong Hong Kong. Um, I, I like the uh, opening st uh, statement um, dealing with trying to simplify the complexity that was apparent in the earlier comments, uh, in part because, in other words, to think of it not as different modalities or different things, but actually one thing. And so, one of the, in looking at that, there was a slide um, earlier uh, by NASDI, which had the typical kind of layered view of uh, trying to deal with that complexity. I think I had sort of physical layer, then you've got the sort of technology layer, da, 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 and social layer at the very top. Um, I have a concern that that characterization is, is, can be simplified. Let me, let me put it in positive terms. Um, the physical layer and the, like the traditional software layer, I think, is no longer valid. Why? Because the emergence of the virtualization of hardware. So the difference between hardware and software, I think, is no more. I don't think we can tell. When you can simulate hardware and software because the computers are so fast, <laughs> then um, that is being exploited by those actors who are, for example, moving piracy to the cloud and they build infrastructures which are all virtual in the cloud, which simulate hardware, and then simulate the software on top of that. So instead of characterizing as physical, what I would suggest is characterization as electrical power, or power is at the bottom. Because fundamentally, that is the infrastructure that if anything happens to power, it doesn't matter whether or not it's physical or software, it doesn't work. In other words, when we lose power, so I think electrical power has to be uh, how it's generated, how it's distributed, how resilient it is, is fundamental to the argument. The second point I'd like to make is, in all of these uh, domains, there's one fundamental characteristic, and that is that the ability to detect the problem um, can cascade as fast as the problem itself occurs. And again, electrical power is the ultimate example, speed of light. 
if the electrical power grid goes down, you wouldn't be able to detect it because the, the rate at which it goes down, the signal to tell you that it's gone down goes at the same rate. So that's why I think the bottom really shouldn't be characterized as hardware. It really should be power. I think that's absolutely fundamental to the argument. Also fundamental to the argument is the issue to do with complexity. And that's why I, I'm, I'm fundamentally of the view that we need to not divide and conquer this, try using traditional strategies of divide and conquer um, this very complex problem into even smaller fragments, uh, which we then throw maths at it and see if it works. The reason why I don't think that works in this case is because there's the social and human element to it which is entirely unpredict un un unpredictable. Let me use an analogy. Um, yesterday, uh, in, in Seoul, as you know, we had this session on uh, the CompuGacha. And these virtual economy games, which are multi-million people play, are bigger than some state actors, okay? And what they're trying to do now in some instances is model disease and how the in-game players respond to the spread of disease. Some people go and help other players. Some people stay away. They ca you can't, it's very difficult to model social behavior mathematically. It has to be done in situ. And so instead of looking at a hierarchy, you have to look at it in some sense a cycle. And I think the one suggestion that I, I raised yesterday at the trade and virtual goods, because I think ultimately we have to frame the issue not in terms of threats, but in terms of opportunities. You actually have a balanced argument. And that's why the trade discussion of virtual goods on the internet, I believe is very important. Why? Because I think the strategy now is no longer divide and conquer. As I mentioned yesterday afternoon, I think the strategy that we need to adopt to solve this issue is really connect and liberate. If I was to summarize, again, what I believe the internet is all about, what we've been doing the last 20 years, is not divide and conquer. That's the last 200 years. If the last 200 years of trade was characterized by war over physical resources and trade in physical goods, as I said yesterday, will the next 200 years be characterized by war over virtual, good, virtual resources and trade over virtual goods? So if we look at it in terms of trade and in terms of trying to provide a positive angle instead of a very defensive angle, I think the discussion can be more balanced. Because I think the defensive angle is in some sense... Even if you solved it, what do you gain? Okay. Uh, yeah. Is the comment related to the uh, Pinder or is something, something else? Let's sort of uh, uh, discuss on the, his comment, if you agree. Is it comment? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Ian Fish, uh, BCS Chartered Institute for IT in the UK. Um, I actually was going to say something very similar, but uh, Peter beat me to it. Um, but it suddenly occurred to me that, uh, that the one way to tackle, tackle this uh, would be to use the formal systems thinking approach, uh, thereby looking at complex systems from a, in a totality rather than in a, I don't know what people think about that if they know the systems thinking approach. It's very difficult to do, but then this is a very large and complex problem. Does anybody want to make a comment? Nazri, are you still there? You want to make a comment? Yes, and I'd love to comment. Yes, please. Uh, I, I find the comments of the, pre the previous uh, speakers very interesting. Um, we all make decisions on how we uh, cut into intersections between two very different domains, like international politics and the structure of the Internet. Uh, on matters of people and values and so forth, we put this under the people element uh, of, of, of the uh, cyber domain and the internet, which is a specific part of it, a framework. Uh, but in fact, remember, there are some physical features that we can't ignore uh, that may be re reduced to energy uh, inputs and, and, and transformation, uh, but they have legally some physical properties under sea cables, for example, um, or alternatively, uh, the, the uh, physical devices like cellular phones which are actually hold it in your hand. So somewhere along the line, we have to go back to what the chairman, uh, Professor Tom, mentioned at the very beginning 
about how we think about the, the physical properties or traditional properties and, and, and the cyber properties. Uh, what I would like to argue is that given the present technology at this point in time, it is almost impossible uh, to avoid physical representations and physical references. And I will use undersea cables as an example. And then to conclude, I would say that we all know that all human activity involves energy and the deployment of energy. But this is not an energy conference or an energy working group. So we have to factor in how we incorporate the, the, the basics uh, of, of, of human interaction into the subject matter for, for this. I was going to say this evening, but I really mean this morning for you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Ian Fish again, just one remark uh, to Nasli. That's exactly why I suggested the systems approach. Binder? Well, I, I was actually suggesting an, a, a further adaptation of the systems approach is looking at biological systems approach because biological systems are extremely complex uh, and yet they're resilient. So the question is what will, you know, what things sort of become extinct and yet the system continues. And that, that those... Um, techniques may be quite uh, interesting to explore. Okay, Amelia. I think it's important not to over-complexify problems that aren't very complex. In the last video that we saw from this Cyber Dialogue conference, it's very clear that we have very strong government interests and economic interests that are aligned in a way which may not be conducive to um, actually most other economic interests and our social goals. And so I guess in, um, in the general political framework of the world, we have been dealing with that conflict already for a long time. Uh, the basic problem formulation is quite simple. And so now is the problem, how do we deal with this again? Um, but we have dealt with it before. And this is also why uh, yeah, I, I don't think that you really need to over-complexify it, basically. Okay, uh Floor. Okay. Hello, I'm, I'm from Indonesia. Uh, one thing I would like to comment from the speakers and also from the videos, I think it is obvious that governing Internet means exercising control, influence, and technology, and all of that related to power. And when we talk about power, like Act, Lord Acton says that power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So it means that everyone or every actor who has power in governing Internet has a potential to abuse it, either it's from the government or private sectors or other stakeholders. So the bigger power one actor has, the bigger potential that actor abuse it. So therefore, it is essential to you know, limit or make boundaries of the power all the actors and set guidance for them. Therefore, I think it should be, should be, uh, there should be a checks and balance mechanism among the actors. Like the, the, the videos inform us, government has strong power to abuse uh, the capacity of the Internet and, and technology to, to violate human rights. But we also have problems with big data where many of the uh, big data are in, in business sector. Thank you. Government. <laughs> Johan, would you like to comment? <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for giving me the, the opportunity to comment. Uh, no, I agree with you. Uh, I think you're quite right. Um, with power comes also responsibilities. And I think that we're seeing some, um, some developments that, that are essentially uh, in the wrong direction. And we see some things that are, that are good. And it's, it's important now as, as we, we go along to continue to work for the good, of course. Um, I think our, our um, work with establishing a link between the human rights framework and the Internet is essential. It's important. Will that, will that mean that no more human rights violations will take place online? No, it will not. But it will give us, give us a a normative framework to continue the discussions from. And that's really important. We see now from the summer's uh, revelations regarding privacy that there is an absolute need 
to deepen the discussions on how to protect the right to privacy. Of course. And in that work, we need to rest on the, the international normative framework that we have. And uh, I agree with, with, uh, with Amelia. Don't make things more complicated than they, than they are. I'm not a technician, I'm a lawyer. So to me, this is very complicated anyway. But what I do know is that the rules that we have in, in the real space could, I think, apply also in cyberspace. And that goes for the right to privacy as well. What we need to understand, we need to do two things. We need to understand the specific challenges that the technology poses. But that doesn't mean we need to change the core of the right. It remains the same. The limits remain the same. The right remains the same. So that's one thing. And secondly, we, we must make the rights work in practice. And in my country, for example, law enforcement agencies must be able to tackle things such as hate speech, for example. They must, be, must get much better at that. And that's the problem we have in my country, I believe. This is my personal opinion. I don't think there is essentially anything wrong with uh, the legislation regarding hate speech, but there is definitely something wrong with the lack of enforcement. So I think you're quite right. Um, what we see is, is, a, is a grab for power and the misuse of power, and that has to be limited. But I do think that we have some tools that we need to refine and, and try to make, to make them work. Okay, uh, yes, go ahead. Oh, yeah, here. Oh, she's gone. Hi, uh, Michael Kelly, law professor at Creighton University. So I, I share your... Uh, angst at trying to understand all of this as a lawyer. But a uh, question for you, uh, Johan. One of the predicates of, of human rights and international law presupposes protection from government actors. And, you know, we're not dealing with uniformly government actors in cyberspace. For instance, torture is not torture unless it's a government actor that's torturing you. If it's a private actor, it's not torture. So uh, how do we get over hurdles like that when we're trying to graft international law and human rights law from the real world into the cyber world? Thanks very much. And that's the challenge, of course, how to, how to have other actors also um, respect human rights standards. And I think we see some developments there as well um, in the international arena. Um, last year we had, for the first time ever, a framework adopted by the UN uh, regarding uh, human rights and business. And it was the result of a, of a multi-year-long um, project which ended in, in, a, in a framework which, in which companies are actually given, for the first time, I think, responsibility to protect human rights, or respect, sorry, to respect human rights, which means that we, we're now actually looking a little bit beyond the traditional relationship between government and individual, by saying that it's, it's not reasonable to, to have corporations uh, clearly violating human rights. We, we can, as an international community, also expect that they do not violate human rights. Um, much of these discussions is still on a voluntary basis. Uh, corporations and companies um, uh, still, to a large extent, need to commit themselves to such frameworks. And from that broad agreement, there, there are a couple of examples of, of um, uh, sectoral and regional uh, continuations. We see the Global Network Initiative, for example, which is, which is a collaboration um, between companies to sign up to a standard uh, which is based on human rights and respect for human rights in, in the ICT area. So the Global Network Initiative is, is one such initiative and one such framework where companies um, voluntarily commit to follow human rights standards. Another one is a work by the European Commission, which now have developed guidelines in a very broad consultation manner, um, developing guidelines based on the UN framework for companies working in the ICT sector. So that's another example. These are quite recent, 
but um, this whole area is also developing very quickly and very fast. So we are we are in a we are in I think in early stages still, but I think we do see some some development uh, that is in in the right direction. Yeah, um, the corporate social responsibility debate for me was always a bit diffuse because we um, regulate companies very strictly to um, uh, behave economically in very particular ways. And so actually CEOs and boards of companies go to jail or uh, get heavily fined if they don't um, act in the best interest, financial interest of their companies. Therefore, one could expect that in the choice between um, a voluntary guideline for being socially responsible and um, acting um, irris like going to jail or being fined, one would opt not to um, uh, be jailed or fined because that is more inconvenient for the CEO. Uh, but I had a, a question for um, actually um, Alejandro Pisanti, if he's still with us. Is he? Alejandro is still here. There is a diffuse microphone and noise. Oh, yeah. Um, because one of the things that has come up also in other panels where I have been is actually the intersection between um, technological standards and policy goals. Um, and I know that uh, Alejandra has been working a lot with the IETF and other technological standard organizations. There is an emerging debate on how uh, also governments are tampering with, with standardization processes. And that means that they're codifying into the very technological framework that we have to use um, for some social or economical purpose, perhaps insecurities, vulnerabilities, backdoors, um, uh, other elements that create uh, inherent distrust for the technologies that we then have to use in order to conduct economic activities. And so, um, but how do you set up a functioning interaction then between uh, more worthwhile goals like the respect for human rights and these technical standard organizations um, because I think one of the questions that we face in, in particularly Europe is that we have laws for human rights also on the Internet for the right to privacy and um, confidential communications, but we find that they're not often um, uh, implemented um, in the technical layer. And so it becomes only a kind of legal construct that everyone agrees is good, uh, but the uh, dialogue with the, with the technical implementers isn't sufficiently strong. And that becomes a problem because then even when you have the moral and ethical leadership and the political leadership that you need, it ends up being um, ineffective. And I see it as a great challenge to overcome that. Thank you, Amelia. Here is Alejandro Pisanti. Can you hear me? Uh, I think that uh, these are very important points. Uh, I think maybe not everybody in the room knows that Amelia is a brilliant mathematician who understands this technical stuff uh, in depth as well. Um, yes, there is an ethical and power issue in uh, technical standardization. You must remember that the standards are not the technologies themselves. The standards developing organizations do not create the technology that is created by inventors in companies, and universities, small labs, companies, etc. Um, the, the standards, of course, have an ethical resonance. And uh, what I can say briefly is that uh, significant technical standardization organizations have ethical codes like the IEEE or the IETF. There is a mandate in the IETF for, uh, for many years now of uh, not creating a technology, uh, not standardizing a technology in order to facilitate surveillance. And what they are doing now, and I use this only as an example, is to go look at a specific threat model. When you do these technical things, you have to start with a threat model. Who is attacking whom? What is the attack for? What is the objective? What is the information asset, for example, that the attacker wants? And the uh, most important model that they are working with right now is called uh, pervasive passive surveillance. That means someone who is not doing something to your equipment, but is somewhere on the net uh, getting information from you. And the discussions are very detailed uh, because you now have to look at things like cryptographic key management and stuff like that, which is very sophisticated. 
Also, because it has been worked upon already, it is are looking mostly at uh, a set of improvements. When governments take these international standards and adopt them as national standards, they are usually doing this for a good reason, which is that they cannot, for example, make a public uh, purchasing, let's say go and buy 10,000 computers or 10,000 licenses for software, based on a foreign standard which is not under their control, so they bring it into the national uh, realm. But then, of course, it can be fiddled with uh, to order, for example, the possibility that the equipment that you buy complies with the international standard X, Y, and Z, but also complies with a national standard that allows uh, the police or the intelligence services to listen into conversations. And you enter a very difficult realm where you don't know whether this uh, uh, surveillance or this wire tapping will be legal in all cases. The technology facilitates it for both the good and the bad. Uh, so these are the kind of dilemmas that come with this technical standardization for uh, preventing uh, illegal surveillance. I think, coming to the broader discussion, that regulating surveillance is uh, a fool's errand, uh, a very hopeless uh, enterprise. Uh, you can regulate espionage as much as you want, but let's just think of, you know, instead of getting very confused in general, let's just think of wiretapping against telephones. There uh, is Alejandro, a let, me cut, let me cut short. We have to finish in okay. uh, one, okay. two uh, minutes. I, I, I will say this in 30 seconds. There is a telephone governance regime, which is the ITU, and what do you get? You have wiretapping and no telephone systems in the world. Okay. Thank you. Adeo, would you like to make uh, the last comment? Yes, uh, okay. Um, two comments. Uh, I just want to, uh, I wanted to, to respond a little bit to Amelia about the standard, the standardization, and the utilization of the standard by company who oh. operate on a very specific legislation or, or legal framework which makes the problem even harder because right. then uh, the, 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 there is that you, you, the European Union can have a, a rule but that rule uh, is not global enough to be applied to a company operating from the US for instance which makes the problem a little, bit, a, a little bit more complex. Another complexity that I think and then as, 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 as engineer we tend to like to simplify but it's, it's end users. As end users uh, who are using technology at different level we also uh, sometimes uh, involuntarily infringe some of those privacy uh, uh, um, or, or have some issue with, with, with privacy or managing privacy, private information that we have that we caught maybe voluntarily or involuntarily. How do we deal with that with the more and more decentralization of power of computers and, 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 and the uh, ability of, of everybody to capture, to manage, to, to, to process more and more powerful information. That is also, also something important. Uh, important. So to finish, I think the multi-stakeholder notion has to come back into, into this. Because to be able to deal and see things from different perspectives is very important to make sure or to find a mechanism which will bring around the table uh, uh, stakeholders from different perspectives to be able to exercise the check and balance within the multi-stakeholder environment and to be able to share the collective responsibility for making this work. Because if the, the responsibility is not collective, it will be very, 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 very hard to just simplify the issue and, 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 and think it is just one side that, that, that will do. Okay, uh, it's 10.30, we have to finish. Uh, first, information, you can find the uh, <laughs> More information on cyberspace and cyberspace governance at uh, cybercommons.net. Can you? Commons.net. Yeah, you can find the many of those uh, information. Also, the, uh, uh, if you have any further comments, please send it to me. My email address is uh, chonkn at gmail. Yeah. Uh, Congratulations, Kilnan, for this workshop. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, we are wondering if we should continue this workshop next year 
or the also we are discussing, probably we may focus also on the human rights workshop or globalization of the Internet. So the, your comment would be appreciated. And in addition, addition I have to write a report. <laughs> okay, thank you for staying up very late, Alejandro and Nazvi. It's 10.30 for them, evening. And I thank you for panelists.